All right, my name is Toussaint Morrison, and I'm with Onsite Public Media, and today I am interviewing Stacy about dyslexia in schools. Uh, Stacy, can you tell me real quickly, how did you get introduced to, uh, I guess, just dyslexia in, in education and, and uh, yeah. Good afternoon, and thank you for speaking with me. No problem. I was first introduced to dyslexia through my son, okay. and he started uh, school a year early through an RSK program, which is um, more of a kindergarten adaptation to help prepare students yeah. who had uh, summer birthdays or who might uh, uh, need an extra year or right. support at that kindergarten level. Yeah. And we uh, approached his teacher that year and asked that the school evaluate him uh, for learning disabilities and uh, explore concerns that we were seeing at the preschool level yeah. as he was having trouble interacting academically uh, uh, with, the, with the programming at yeah. his private pre preschool. So you noticed this, you approached the teacher, um, and I'm assuming, you know, for me working as a paraprofessional, like, you know, you, would, the thing I've heard, you know, from a lot of teachers, they say, you know, I, my boss is the principal and I have 60 other bosses, which are the parents of the students. Do, do, do you kind of get, what was the response from the teachers when you approached them? Because I know that that can be difficult for them as well, because, you know. It can be, and it was uh, an eye-open experience. Mm -hmm. uh, we have always been very pleased with the teachers that our kids have had. However, we've grown um, dissatisfied with some of the answers that we've gotten when we've brought concerns to them. It has felt at times that they're conflicted about how to help, uh, mm. when to help. Uh, the teachers are conflicted about when to help and how to help? In hindsight, that's very much uh, yeah. how I would express that. Particularly in the RSK year mm. for our son, uh, we were told, well, this is Ready Start Kindergarten. Uh, yeah. It's not kindergarten, so you would have to go back to early childhood family education oh. and ask them for an evaluation. And as a family, we had already done that uh, a year prior, and he hadn't qualified for services. So I had to challenge that answer uh, and then wait weeks, likely months, before the teacher came back and, and said, I had another conversation with our principal and given that he is old enough to be in kindergarten, um, we're gonna go ahead and evaluate him. Although at this point, mm, three-fourths of a school year had expired. So this is precious time that's passing by. It you is. Know, that's where you know, your son is not able to get these services, they're determining things. Uh, how are you feeling at that moment when that was going on? If this is your first experience with it, I'm assuming mm -hmm. this goes down the line, your, your son is 11 now. Were you just kind of like, huh, standard protocol, or were you a little, a little more agitated? Um, it did not feel like standard protocol to me, okay. and it was a mismatch for our expectations with regard to the experience we'd had with our daughter, who'd went through the same elementary school mm. um, and was a fifth grader at the time, yeah. and the expectation that the district sets um, for the community. Minnetonka Public Schools is the wealthiest school district in the state of Minnesota, and they advertise uh, their excellence in terms of academic programming. So it was a misfit for us, um, expressing concerns about our son's ability uh, to recite the alphabet, to know the letters, to understand the sound relationships, mm -hmm. um, to get confirmation from the teacher that she was experiencing the same things, but yet we couldn't come to a common identification of appropriate next steps. So, I, I can I can see how that would you would think that's not standard protocol. You're working with one of the wealthiest school districts in the state, and yet they're not able to see eye to eye with you, or even were they able to offer any services and say, hey, let, the, we can offer this program or or this service. We got for your there. Son? Yes, we got there. So uh, an evaluation was done at the end mm -hmm. of his RSK year, and. Yeah. They, however, determined that he would qualify for specialized services via an individualized education plan, but based on a qualification criteria of autism. Nope. And we were surprised, but we were trusting the school as educational experts. Yeah. And part of what they proposed was specialized instruction in reading. 
However, it was only 10 minutes a day, and that was his greatest area of need. However, at that time, nothing was said about the possibility of a learning disability, mm -hmm. um, that that being dyslexia. Mm -hmm. And when I now go back and look at the data with what I know now, after yeah. having educated myself and um, getting the input from multiple experts, is that the district had all the data that they needed in that evaluation mm -hmm. to know that our son had a severe learning disability in reading. And that 10 minutes of intervention a day was not adequate for a student who was less than 0.1 percentile uh, in reading. But I didn't know that at the time. Uh -huh. And so I was still choosing at that time to trust the school district. Yeah. And I was grateful that we were finally getting services. So you're getting services f as, as if he were on the spectrum for autism, yes? The services he were getting, they were broad. Um, they, oh, okay. weren't, they weren't focused on dyslexia or reading, uh, whereas clearly the data in the evaluation showed that that was his greatest area of need mm -hmm. by far. Uh, his services were 10 minutes of reading, 10 minutes of math, and social component, and then some indirect OT services. Yeah, so some occupational therapy. Uh, so when did you find out he had dyslexia or has dyslexia? Not until we sought a private neuropsychological evaluation in the third grade. So one, two, three years pass and what happens in, within that time period? Within that time period our son continued to get reading interventions. Mm -hmm. um, they went in his RSK year from 10 minutes a day. The next year it was 15 minutes a day. Um, the next year it was incrementally increased again, but the method that they were using to teach him never changed. Um, mm. And he didn't ever progress beyond the late kindergarten, first grade level, and that's where he started his fourth grade year. Okay, and so then he gets diagnosed. What is the impact on your son and you once this diagnosis comes through? Was it like celebration? Was it like, oh, aha, we finally figured it out? or? Was there there's some sorrow there as to my goodness, you know, all this time has passed and it was know. all of that. Yeah. Um, a lot of frustration as I felt like we were doing the best we could advocating, trusting the experts at the mm -hmm. school and were not were not met with good faith. Yeah. Uh, we were met with systemic issues that I see in terms of teachers being held back from having frank conversations mm. uh, driven by data. Mm -hmm. um, it, I felt like my son was impacted by staffing levels. He was impacted by the need for the principal to provide a higher level, more intensive, more evidence-based services to uh, a different student population, uh, mm -hmm. despite my son who demonstrated um, a significant need for the services above and beyond some of the other students in the building who were getting them. What, now what do you mean by staffing level? It was affected by staffing level. This to me has a few different uh, aspects to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And to answer the question, I think a good illustration would be uh, a, f a flashback to an IEP meeting where my husband and I were in the principal's office yeah. and when we were asking her to explain to us why our son could not receive the intensive reading intervention that the neuropsychological expert recommended mm -hmm. and that the district had teachers trained in and that they were providing to other, serv other children, mm -hmm. her answer, one of her answers to my husband <clears throat> was well, it's somewhat based on fund accounting. And my husband's a CPA, and so he didn't need a lesson that day on fund accounting. But it was a real wake-up call that we're not, the educational experts from the school who are on our son's IEP team mm -hmm. are clearly not making decisions based on what he needs. They're making decisions based on their budgets wow. or their staffing levels. Wow. And that was, um, <coughs> that was a, another yet another turning point for us. 
The trust was broken prior to that point. Um, With when Minnetonka Public Schools? It was. when w The point in time that that occurred to us that we're, we're no longer working in a healthy functioning partnership on behalf of our son mm. uh, was in second grade. And I remember very clearly sending an email to his general education teacher and his special education case manager and laying out eight different points uh, of concerns mm -hmm. that I had, dyslexia being one of them. Yeah. And uh, was, in, was met with an offer to, well, let's meet. Uh, it was not a formal IEP team meeting, mm -hmm. but rather an informal meeting that um, once it was scheduled, had to be rescheduled for farther down the road. And the special education teacher led that meeting and was showing us, uh, you know, here's the blue and pink uh, Dixie cups that I used to show him the different, you know, letters, sounds, yeah, yeah, yeah. consonants versus vowels. And he's working <coughs> so hard and here's a binder and we flipped through it and we were really encouraged to celebrate the very minimal de minimis progress that he was making. Mm -hmm. um, without any of our concerns actually being addressed. So it almost sounds like it's just pandering or just like just... There was a lot of pandering and the pandering in hindsight was happening throughout. Yeah. We didn't wake up to it until the, he was in the second grade. Yeah, yeah. And waking up to that um, also came with the realization that we're spending time, precious time in developmental years. And you're spending money too. And we're I mean, spending money. This, this entire time frame that he was in school up until um, the middle of third grade, we were paying for private services for six years, yeah. um, doing what we thought he needed based on an inaccurate um, communication of an autism qualification. Whereas had we been able to have an honest conversation uh, based on data uh, yeah. on, on the record, that he had dyslexia, that he needed, you know, phonological awareness uh, mm -hmm. uh, instruction, that he needed very explicit, systematic, multi-sensory uh, reading interventions. We would have targeted that uh, as parents. Each time we were given advice, we acted on that. We didn't sit on it. Mm -hmm. And to think that we spent um, years uh, focusing on the wrong things. Yeah. Um, it's my biggest regret. And when you when you look back at it, do you what, what's what was the move then? Once you found out in third grade, and then the trust is broken, and and I guess the question is, what what is your son saying at this time? Um, at this time in third grade, my son was calling himself stupid. It was very clear that he was aware that he couldn't do things that his other friends and peers could do in his classroom. Yeah. yeah. And his self-esteem was really suffering. Was there any frustration and anger or? You know, surprisingly, um, he's a very happy, um, positive um, uh, human being. Yeah. And throughout all of this, that has maintained. And in fact, um, a couple of the doctors that have worked with him have commented that, you know, it's it's really a testament to who he is mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, because he has every reason to be much more frustrated and angry than he is. Yeah, yeah. and that sounds like a through line for a lot of kids with mm -hmm. dyslexia. It's, it's this separation from, from everyone else. Yeah. And then the constant uh, reach and uh, forcible, you know, uh, just assimilate, assimilate with mm -hmm. the classroom, normalize with us, normalize with us yep. when really um, what, I, what it sounds like we're discussing is letting, letting the culture of these schools uh, kind of carve out space for these kids anyways, instead of trying to force them into uh, what they believe is, uh, should be the, uh, the, I guess, the, the, the pathway that they've already set, you know, um, the rails that they've already set. And it sounds like Minnetonka Public Schools wasn't necessarily uh, too flexible with that. And so moving forward, I'm curious what happened with Minnetonka Public Schools mm -hmm. and, and your son. Do you, do you take them out and take them somewhere else? Or what, what, do, you, what do you do once you realize that the, the wealthiest school district in the state is not serving your kid? And not only doing that, they're, they're, it sounds like they're not taking accountability for it either. What, what was the next move after that? 
So the next move after that for us, after um, you know, our experience of waking up to all of these very difficult truths, was we could look to send him somewhere else, um, but when you're in a very highly ranked school district, yeah. um, there aren't a lot of other places that you can go to for yeah. support. Yeah. Um, we chose to get him tutoring outside of school to supplement yeah. what he was getting in school. Um, there's a cost to that, not only financially, yeah. but yeah. to the students. You know, he, every, every hour he spent with a tutor, it wasn't um, with a friend at a play date, it wasn't on a sports team, yeah. or it wasn't doing something enjoyable, um, yeah. you know, building hobbies or skills. Yeah. So we chose to file a complaint with the Minnesota Department of Education. Mm -hmm. And that was when um, our son was in third grade. He, the school district was found in violation of a procedural violation, wow. um, but there were no substantive violations found. What does substantive violations mean? Substantive would mean to me that uh, they didn't provide him the right level of instruction. Yeah. Or that they missed the mark in teaching him. Mm, mm -hmm. uh, what the complaint ruling read to me was that the school district went through all of the motions. He qualified, oh, he demonstrated a need, yeah, 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 yeah. they offered him a program, uh -huh. that's all that's required. Yeah, hey, we did our job, okay, let's move mm -hmm. on. Yeah. Um, what I feel like the complaint failed to acknowledge is the complete lack of progress. Uh, for a student to be in the same intervention over a period of four years um, with an average intelligence and no other reason for not being able to learn how to read uh, without yeah. assessing whether the program's appropriate, the teaching method's appropriate, um, is not in good faith in my mind. And so not assessing the progress and just going through the motions, that's kind of what you, you, you addressed. And how did that go? He was warehoused, in my opinion, for mm -hmm. four years in the public school system in yes. one of the best districts in our state. And so you brought this up with the Board of Education? Um, the Minnesota Department of Education. Minnesota Department of Education. Yep. And, and what happened from there? Um, there was no recourse. Um, f at that point, uh, our next IEP meeting, uh, we... Uh, were advised by the district that because we were bringing an advocate from an organization called PACER, uh, mm -hmm. which is a national organization that uh, helps families advocate for their disabled children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, We were bringing a, a PACER representative to our meeting as our advocate to advocate for what our son needed in yeah. terms of the teaching methodology that had since been denied to him. Uh -huh. uh, the district chose to bring outside legal counsel to our meeting. Oh. And what did that mean to you when they brought that in? Um, what it meant to me is that it was, it was an extremely heavy-handed move. It was like time to lawyer up. It was a power play. Yeah, yeah. It was a, uh, a very uh, bold declaration that they prevailed in their complaint ruling uh -huh. and that they were going to double down wow. and show us um, that they were going to drive decision making. Mm -hmm. I believe that they brought that attorney to render our advocate uh, ineffective. Wow. It's a policy with that organization that if an attorney is present that they, are, they do not participate. Wow, okay. So they knew what they were up against. They knew what they were dealing with. They did and it worked. I mean, our advocate was not able to participate. She listened okay. in on the phone and that's, um, all that she was able to do. Wow. And this was after I asked the district and their uh, corporate lawyer uh, to please dismiss himself from the meeting so that my advocate could participate. Sure. And uh, the executive director from the district uh, denied that request and implied that by the district's legal counsel being present, that that would be also of benefit to myself. Uh -huh and my son, which um, is, not, uh, is not true. 
So all this is happening. What's going on with, with, with you and how you're feeling? And what's going on with your son and, and, and how he's feeling? Like, what are the emotions at this point? Are there any points in you that are like, you know what? We should probably just back out of this. This is getting wild. You know, interestingly enough, I don't think my husband and I ever had the conversation or sat down contemplating the decision about backing out. Okay. And the reason is because we were very clear that our son is clearly struggling with a learning disability. Mm -hmm. And we have put him in an environment where we've told him that we trust his teachers and that his school is a good and safe place for him to go and to learn. Yeah. And we've, we've required that he has to navigate that. Mm -hmm. And so we felt that it was our responsibility to navigate the rest of it outside of that. Yeah. Yeah, almost to like fulfill what you said you'd follow through yeah. on. And so, how is your son feeling at this point? Uh, at this point, he's very frustrated. Um, there were times that we at home would see some anger or frustration spike. Yeah. Um, when we would sit down to talk about it, um, he was able to articulate, uh, for example, the summer after his third grade year, yeah. uh, we hired a private tutor uh -huh. who came into our home and taught him with a uh, evidence-based, multi-sensory structured uh, reading program five days a week uh, for two months straight. And it was difficult for our son at first um, because we're now, he, he can't escape. This is now in his home. Yeah. And we're asking him to do the hardest thing um, possible that we could ask of him. It took... Um, what was the hardest thing possible to ask of him? To once again trust a teacher mm. to teach him how to read. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When he has a learning disability mm -hmm. and he's tried already for over five years yeah. um, with a handful of, of teachers yeah. to learn how to read. Um, so he engaged um, with this private tutor and at one point at bedtime, this is before he was getting ready to go back to school, the beginning yeah. of fourth grade, um, he was um, sad and I, th and I thought he was upset with me and I said, you know, is it something that I've done? Can, I, can we talk through it? And he said, I'm not mad at you, I'm mad at the school. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, why? He said, I just spent my whole summer learning how to read and now I know that I can learn how to read. That was the school's job. Why didn't they teach me? Yeah. And so that's one way that I can share with you about how he was feeling. Mm -hmm. um, he continued to work hard. Um, all of his teachers have described him as a hard worker, mm -hmm. uh, but very easily distracted. And I think when you are working on something that you've tried over and over and over and that which is your weakness, um, I'm just really grateful that he had the stamina to hang in there until we finally got him what he needed. And I've heard this before, you know, in, in, in these situations, you know, where kids do engage in um, harmful language towards, towards themselves, mm -hmm. was he able to turn that around? You said earlier that he started calling himself stupid. Mm -hmm. Did he still engage in that? Um, it started to wane. And, and today, I don't hear it. And so mm -hmm. that's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so now with the, the, the attorney present, do you then find a lawyer or what, what happens from after that meeting? It was very clear to us um, after that meeting that we needed to engage an attorney, that working with an advocate um, wasn't gonna be enough. Wasn't gonna be no. enough. And so we hired um, the school law center. Um, at this point, I had requested all of his records. Um, they were well organized. Uh, I understood now the, um, the record, his educational record. Mm -hmm. um, I could see now in hindsight what I wasn't able to see in the moment years ago. Yeah. And um, we filed for due process uh, in the summer of 2019. Mm -hmm. So in August. And now what does that mean to file for due process? What that means um, is students who are on an individual education plan, mm -hmm. they have what's called procedural safeguards. Yeah. So an IEP is a legally binding document that mm -hmm. outlines what 
specialized services are required in order for the public school uh, system to provide that child mm -hmm. with a free and appropriate public education. So there are procedural safeguards that each family is given every year. You can find mm -hmm. them on your State Department of Education website that outline what your steps, your graduating steps of conflict resolution methods are. Mm -hmm. um, we at this point have spent years taking each of those incremental steps prior to filing due process. I mean, I've talked you through some of the things that we did to try and collaborate and partner with the district yeah, yeah, yeah. and advocate. Um, in addition to that, we requested a facilitated IEP meeting, uh -huh. uh, whereas if both parties agree, the Minnesota Department of Education would facilitate a meeting between the family and the school district, mm -hmm. um, but the school district refused. Uh, we requested mediation um, yeah. with the district, and the district refused. And so we had exhausted all other uh, avenues to try and resolve the fact that the public school system was failing to teach our child who has average intelligence, but yet a learning disability, how to read. Mm -hmm. And so that led us to a due process hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, in order to get there, um, there were various resolution or settlement conversations, all of which um, were not fruitful. And we had a five-day hearing in December of 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, there were over 1,400 pages of exhibits and um, over 1,100 pages of transcript from mm -hmm. the court reporter. And in January of this year, an administrative law judge ruled that Minnetonka Public Schools uh, denied our son a free and appropriate public, public education. And uh, I'm assuming some of those pages there represent that, that lawsuit. It is. Um, and it also represents the civil lawsuit that the school district has since filed against my husband and I in federal district court to appeal that ruling. Now what does that mean when they file a civil lawsuit against you? That would be the mechanism that they take to appeal the lower court's ruling mm -hmm. that was made in January. Okay. Um, it's concerning to us for a multitude of reasons. Are they filing this to kind of get this expunged from their, their, their record or to, to uh, I don't know, um, kind of exonerate them of the way that they treated your son? Yes, um, they're asking for the entire ruling to be overruled. Oh, wow. um, they're specifically challenging uh, a statute of limitations, meaning how far back it can be considered that they caused harm. Oh, wow. So at best, they're trying to limit their um, responsibility or yeah, accountability. Yeah. Yeah. And at best, from their perspective, they're trying to completely expunge it. Do you ever start thinking about, well, you know, hey, this has happened to my son. We're going through this. Uh, this has cost time, money, energy, spirit, sanity, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And do you ever think, oh, gosh, what is happening with other students? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> I mean. We're very present to the fact that this is not just happening to our son. Yeah. We are aware of other situations, other families in our very own elementary building, mm -hmm. um, that there are very common threads uh, of, of, of our son's story that's happening to other students. Yeah. And then I'm also very present to the fact that if this is happening to our family, and yeah. we're very educated, we're sophisticated, we're privileged enough, um, you know, financially, uh, as well as, I don't know if stubborn's the right word, but being ambitious. able, ambitious enough, yeah. right, to navigate um, the system that has, has proven to be so concerning and at times convoluted, and that that, and doing so takes years. Yeah, yeah. Um, that if it's this difficult for us, uh, it has to be insurmountable for many, many families. And if this is happening in one of the highest ranked school districts yeah. in our state, this has to be happening everywhere. 
And that breaks my heart for all of the students um, who are dyslexic, like our son. Um, he's not the only one who's going through this. And we talk about the frustration and the, the self-harming -harm, language. And I guess my question is, is and, and being a person of color, I, I never really saw too many black kids that were diagnosed with dyslexia. Well, what is this I mean, race being involved, but just as an overarching theme, what do you want to have happen for kids with dyslexia? Like, what would you say to them, you know, from your experience with all mm -hmm. this, like, what would you say to those families if, if they're listening right now? I feel like we are in a position where we are privileged enough to be able to fight this fight. Yeah. Um, it's been very challenging on a, on a number of different fronts. Mm -hmm. And the farther, um, the longer it's taken and the more difficult it's become, the more committed we are to doing that yeah. for this community. Yeah. I don't want to pretend that I can understand what someone else's struggles are mm -hmm. because there are layers that my son doesn't experience that other children do, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that low-income children do, or minority children do, mm -hmm. or children who um, are in school districts who have far fewer supports than, than the one that I'm in. That aren't the wealthiest districts right. in the state, yeah. So I struggle a little bit about uh, what would I say because I want to make sure that, that it would be meaningful um, mm -hmm. to who needs to hear it. Mm -hmm. And I'm still sorting out why in the world does this problem even exist? Yeah. And it's, it's the idea that, I mean, I've, I've heard this phrase said so many times in the past three months, uh, as it is August in 2020, you know, we wouldn't be here if they did their job, you know? And that, that really is what it boils down to. And what it sounds like right now is the job that was not done is being defended for not being done, or they're trying to defend not, not doing it. So before we wrap up, um, I'm curious, what, what, is, what have you learned about dyslexia in this whole process? And have you reached out to other parents and have you found out about, you know, maybe groups of parents that can support one another and how to advocate for students with dyslexia? Or has this all just been an isolated incident and you haven't met anybody else that's been in your struggle? No, it's been anything but isolating. Mm -hmm. um, We've met several families, and it has been uh, reassuring to know that um, student by student, family by family, that, that we are building a support network for each other. Mm. But it pales in comparison to the public school systems that are built, to the uh, reading ro wars that are waging right between yeah professionals even at a teaching college level or at a uh, publishing company level mm. and from a capitalistic perspective it's you know a billion dollar industry yeah. it becomes a financial issue because there's curriculum that's already in the schools that would have to be replaced yeah. and in order for that to translate into meaningful progress for the students we need to educate and retrain teachers. We need to rewire the system, it sounds We like. do, we do. And so even though it's reassuring to know that there's other students that uh, are comforted knowing that they're not alone mm -hmm. and that they're not the only one who has dyslexia, it's not enough. Um, this needs a much larger lens, a much larger spotlight, mm -hmm. much larger sponsorship. Yeah. And the fact that our communities are just in pockets struggling and helping themselves stay afloat yeah. isn't causing change fast enough. Mm -hmm. We're losing kids who can't read. Um, it, the ability to read changes the trajectory of someone's life. Absolutely. And the whole purpose of our public education system 
is to prepare our children to have a productive life as mm. an adult. Yeah. We're not doing that as a society if we are allowing our public school system to graduate students who aren't literate. And so, and where that starts, I mean, I'm, it's a conversation for another time, I'm sure we can get into that, how that change can happen, where it starts, where, where it needs to um, be, uh, be taking action most. Uh, I want to, I wanna, I wanna wrap up really quickly with what, what's like up next for you, like what, where does the fight go from here? Um, and it, in, in, the, in the lawsuit, they're saying that they provided your son was state-of-the-art educational uh, programming, but he was not able to act. But he was not able to access it, which is basically saying that this is on your son. Mm -hmm. It's your son's mm -hmm. fault. Um, and in my, Minnetonka Public Schools, with the, the the slogan "Where Dreams Set Sail," I mean, how do you? And they, they also said that he, had, that he had a double deficit, which we'll, I, I want to get into really quickly. What what is this? What is this that they're saying back to you? And then I want to ask, what is, the, what is the reaction after that? But So when they say they provided, when, Minit when, Minit when Minnetonka Public Schools says that they provided your son with state-of-the-art educational programming, but he was not able to access it, and also that he had a double deficit, what does all that mean? If you could just decode that for us really quick. The intention of those statements are yeah. to assert that the school district fulfilled their, not only did they fulfill their responsibility yeah. um, to, you know, provide him uh, uh, teaching methods, you know, in, in the, the appropriate areas, uh -huh. that they did so above and beyond the standards that are required of them, and that um, even by doing so, he failed to um, engage in those programs and make progress. Okay. And that that's on him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then double deficit. Double deficit would mean that uh, it's a, sev a very severe form of dyslexia. So the way I understand it is there's two components, uh -huh. or there can be two components uh, in totality to dyslexia. The first one is a phonological awareness component, mm -hmm. and that's the most common deficit that students have who are dyslexic. Yeah. And then the other component is called rapid automatic naming. So that's another skill that's required to become a proficient reader. Yeah. And if a student is deficit, uh, deficient in both of those areas, yeah. that's considered a double deficit, meaning it's gonna be even harder for that student to learn how to read. It's still very likely possible. Yeah. Um, a student of average intelligence, you know, over 97% of those kids can and do learn how to read with the appropriate evidence-based scientific you know multi-sensory structured literacy yeah. um, teaching methods so it's not the student's ability that's lacking it's the teaching method that's mm. lacking for over 90 percent of our kids mm. so for a school district to posture and take the position that it's not our fault it's his yeah um was extremely concerning for me and to do so in front of a judge uh, on the record yeah. when there's not data to support that um, created a whole nother level of concern to me about their, abil their need mm -hmm. to win a case for the sake of saving their reputation the look, or their yeah. ego or yeah. their image Mm -hmm. versus teaching our children how to read. Yeah, yeah. It sounds, it, it sounds so simple. I mean, and this is, <laughs> this is me coming from a standpoint of really, you know, kind of engaging with uh, processing your own ego and whatnot. And it's tough to admit you're wrong sometimes. And accountability is an insanely tough thing for not only people to do, but for institutions to do. And it shouldn't be tough. It really shouldn't, the, the way I feel about it. And it's just saying, hey, you know what, we messed up. We actually screwed up. Let's make it better. Because as you said earlier, how many other kids are experiencing mm -hmm. this? How many other kids are going through this? 
And, and, and I'll wrap up on this. How, how has your son been responding or, or what has your son said to all of this uh, leading up to now? Uh, your son is 11 now and mm -hmm. in, in what grade? He's 11 and he's a rising fifth grader. Okay. Um, the good news is, is he's making progress. Great. So since the court order, um, he's been receiving uh, both phonemic awareness training okay. one-on-one. -on -one. He's been receiving um, specific targeted appropriate um, teaching methods for reading. This is from Minnetonka Public Schools? H yes. Um, so they could have done all along? <laughs> yes, they, they had the ability <gasps> to do this all along. Goodness. Um, but once they were ordered to do so, they have stepped up and they have provided that to him, even um, during distance learning. Yeah. And so the good news is, is he's making progress. Great, great. And it's a testament to how this works and how it can work for yeah. so many other students. And I think that instead of a district choosing to be litigious yeah. and um, use taxpayer dollars to, mm. um, uh, you know, fight a family, fight a student in court. Mm. Uh, it could really be used as a platform to demonstrate how we can make a difference for these kids mm -hmm. and start gathering new data on progress that we haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. build, build these kids' self-esteem. Mm -hmm. Um, help them learn how to read and change the trajectory of their life. And that should be a base level request. My kids should be able to read when they come in and out of your building, right? Reading is a civil right. Um, Absolutely. It is a life skill, a critical life skill. And I don't think that we should be fighting about it in court. I think we should be teaching our kids in school. I don't think I can wrap up on a better phrase than that. Um, I know that this conversation won't stop here, but Stacy, I'm very compelled from your story and the other stories I've heard today to keep this conversation going. And I look forward to um, other parents that, that empathize and recognize uh, what you're going through and, and, and how this, this conversation plays out. And I, I look forward to speaking to you down the road and I, I wish your, your son the, the most success down the road as well. So thank you for the time and energy. Thank you.